order at six o'clock. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? All right. Um, for the minutes of Monday, April 25th, 2022. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? We're hearing none, so moved. Is there any board correspondence? Um, Bill, what's your last name again? Uh, Bill Gore is here for um, the board development series. So I will let you take over. I don't see a, a link to the meeting. So should I just look at that camera yeah. and just kind of point that way? You're Bill, right? Right. So it's a pleasure to be with you again. We'll just jump right in here. I'll leave a mask on. I've been exposed to COVID this last week. I, I don't have it. I've had some negative tests, but I'll leave the mask on. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay online. Thank you. So as you, uh, hopefully you can see that slide on your screen there, talking about vision, mission, and then this idea of inclusion. Uh, I, I can share, in fact, I'll try to forward after this meeting, maybe tomorrow, uh, a couple of statements that we've been using in helping people develop missions and visions, kind of some attributes of effective mission and vision statements. I think that's helpful. But, you know, thinking of your vision, first of all, what's the ideal state for the future, right? A vision should describe if, if we do our job well, this is what things will look like, feel like, sound like, smell like in the future, right? That it should cast toward the ideal future state. The mission, on the other hand, this is what you do. I, I was just sharing with the room here before we, we started, I, I learned strategic planning from a, a Marine Colonel. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was, it was very clear, very to the point, very direct. Uh, he would insist a school district or a supervisory union's mission is educate kids. And, and Colonel Vitos, who passed away a couple years ago, he would say all the rest is fluff, or he had some other words for it too. But, you know, when you, when you develop a mission, you want to be crystal clear so that you come up with something that is memorable and it becomes contagious, right? We, we all know what contagious means. It sticks. It, it, people can hang on to it. This idea of inclusion, and that's where I, I want to get at the community piece. Uh, I've been involved the last 20 years in research and governance, and we have all been committed for a long time about community engagement. We know that parent to school partnerships are important. We can see how um, the business community and sometimes other intergovernmental agencies can collaborate with a school district in effective ways, and we can see the benefits of that. What's the board's role in community engagement? And, and I would encourage you to think about how does your board engage the community? Not the district, not, not a principal or a teacher or anyone else working in the school system, but where's the opportunity for the board to engage with, involve with, and partner with the community? And I'll just share this, and uh, we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more in just a couple minutes, but the idea that um, in the state of Texas in the last five years, we did a study there that showed a very strong relationship between boards that said they engaged their community in the board's work and the likelihood that their students were improving in achievement and closing gaps at the same time. Kind of what my, my former boss used to call the magic rabbit the, or the elusive rabbit that I was chasing. Like, what do boards do in the system, legitimate governance level activities that might have a relationship with improving achievement for all kids and closing gaps at the same time? And many of the elements involve the way the board talked about how they engage their community. Let's, let's go to that next slide, Bill. You, just, you can just keep clicking. So and just foundationally here, one of the things important to point out is school boards do affect student achievement, right? They, they do have an impact. You may have your book here. 
this uh, this book published almost seven years ago. Uh, Tom Alsberry and I put this together. It's a compilation, actually, of uh, 22 different authors. It's in called uh, Improving School Board Effectiveness, a Balanced Governance Approach. You buy that on Amazon? Yeah. yeah. You can buy it on Amazon, or I can sell you one a little cheaper. But um, not, not here to sell books tonight. Just to point out, there's a, there's a clear linkage between what boards do in the boardroom and the likelihood that students are le learning in the classroom. I just know nobody's going to say if the board does this, kids learn more. Somebody might say that, but they're um, they're not very honest and they're lacking in integrity. You you can't prove a correlation relationship between a causation relationship between what boards do. What you can show is that in districts where students are improving in learning. Boards have different beliefs about what is possible and they have different actions at the board table. So what you see on the slide in front of you right now is a summary in five different areas, which research has shown boards have a relationship in what boards do with student learning. Uh, one, of, one of the things that stands out there is having a vision and goals for the district. It's a governance activity, right? If you think about who owns what, the strategic is in the vision, the mission, and then with the goals. And I like to think that goals are kind of a shared area or, or domain, but the board needs to own and have responsibility for the vision and mission of the district, right? And you need to be measuring and assessing throughout the year and every year, are we making progress on our mission and vision? Then those goals, they get co-owned with the administration and with the board, right? But you got the strategic domain and then you get into the tactical and then however your nomenclature is in your current strategic plan and in your future one, uh, you get down into the objectives and tasks and activities. Those are not, those are not, should not be prescribed by the board, right? There may be things that are important to the board, but you're down into the how or what a lot of people would call the weeds. So each of these areas on that slide have been shown to have an effect on student success, but this uh, kind of elusive one, it was hard to, to make a proof, if you will. Mary Della Gardell, who wrote chapter one in, in Bill's book, um, she passed away a few years ago, but she was the principal researcher on a multi-state study founded, uh, funded by the Department of Education called the Iowa Lighthouse Research Study. And she looked at um, boards' beliefs and behaviors and what boards did and what they believed and if that might affect student achievement. And she couldn't let go of the community engagement piece. She couldn't prove it, but she just, in her heart and in her mind, she knew there had to be something important there. And in fact, there is. Let's go to that next slide. So we're learning about this, this community engagement or community involvement piece that uh, again, boards have an effect and what is it? What does that look like? What does it feel like? I'm gonna suggest to you that one of the key areas might be a culture of inclusiveness. And that, that's my best understanding. Does the board speak and act and deliberate in an inclusive manner? Are they including staff, community members, families, students, in their decision making. Let's go to that next slide. I can't see them well up there, but it, we're, we're okay. Um, so thinking about how does the board do this? What's the board's role in engaging and involving the community? You don't have any role in uh, those family to teacher relationships, right? You might have a policy, you might have a uh, a request of the administration. We'd like to ensure that all of our schools are intentional in the way they engage families and their students' education. Great, pretty high level. But how that happens is gonna vary from one classroom to the next, just like how reading is taught, how math is taught, how science is taught, um, how the activities play out in an individual classroom. You may have policies uh, that you're hoping for this, but individually, that's going to be adapted. So where's the board's role? Let's go to the next slide. So this was just a list. I've got two slides that I just wanted to show you a, a strong effect size 
very, if you look up the statistical measure effect size, you'll find that a very small effect size over a system of schools can still be meaningful and, and very important. But look at this slide and then the next one, and the elements within these things that seem to have an effect or a relationship between what boards say they're doing and whether or not their district is improving in achievement and closing gaps, look at the overlapping nuances of that culture of inclusion, this community engagement. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that all the way back to that first slide and the first thoughts here, where the board can engage and involve its community is really in clarifying a vision for what success looks like, and then defining the mission of the district. Those are two high level, very strategic opportunities for the board to get community involvement and engagement in. Let's go to the next slide here. This is a very important slide. There's a researcher out of Canada uh, named Michael Fullen. He's done a lot of uh, educational leadership work and he emphasizes this idea of coherence. And Michael Fullen has promoted the idea that what's happening in an individual teaching and learning opportunity, a teacher in a classroom of students, it needs to make sense with what the administration is doing, right? I've used the word alignment for years. Uh, Fullen kind of poo-poos that because alignment is, uh, that's like algebra one, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the coherence is more like geometry, like the, these Venn diagrams. Does it make sense what, what the board is doing, what the administration is doing, what the teachers are doing? Do these things fit together? I still kind of like the word alignment and I use it often, but coherence, it, it's, does this all make sense? And you notice, I think, in this diagram, if, if we're on the right slide, which I think we are, Meg had a question um, too when you it, it, that you'll notice there's a role here for um, the public. There's actually, in my version of the slides, these are overlapping circles, but that, that's okay. It changes when we go to Google some or, no, no, oh, it's it, you see it, okay, we just don't see it up there. Megan, you, you wanna go back to it? I'm, I'm great with that, sorry. Kathy will have to throw something at me next time. Totally up to you. I, I think I understand your point, but I just, those numbers didn't make any sense to me. But if you oh, want to okay. Know, effect size, yeah. The D. Um, yeah, the D stands for effect size. It's a statistical technique. I, I would encourage you to look that up because um, effect size is a statistical measure that uh, has been widely touted by education researchers in the last couple of decades. And it's like, so, it, if you've got this group not doing it compared with the group that is, what effect does that seem to have on uh, the outcome, if you will? And it, it's kind of like correlation, but it's it's calculated in a different way. Yeah, Bill? The higher is better. Yeah, higher is better. Uh, the higher the effect size, the better. So you see that, that one with what's considered a, a large or a very large effect size, 0.650, uh, does the board have a process that includes community and parent involvement in selecting curriculum? Now it's interesting, uh, every state's different in the way some of these things play out. Uh, in the state where this is done, community and parents rarely have any involvement in curriculum matters. But the board said they did. <laughs> so there seems to be, uh, the effect size is that the board made this claim that they were involving them. So again, from, from the perception of a person responding to a, a board survey or a self-assessment, uh, they, they felt like they were inclusive of the community. Sarah? She's muted. You're muted, Sarah. That's the first time for that, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, um, yeah. It's always been, I'm going, I'm back on the, uh, curriculum to, um, and the, the board having, um, you know, involving the, the board being involved. I always thought that was man, that was the administration and not um, the board's responsibility to set curriculum. Yeah, and, and I would I would tend to agree with you. I think, you know, this could be a policy that involves supplemental materials, um, those kinds of things. And uh, it, again, that would vary. It's hard to know what's in somebody's head when they answer a question and say, we do that, but they were saying they did that. And um, 
So yeah. Are you advocating that that is something that we should be doing? Because that sort of goes against uh, my understanding of the board's role. No, I would advocate that the the board involves the community in the board's work. So no, not not not, not a curriculum matter per se. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks for asking the question. And um, let's just keep moving, Bill, to the next slide. So now let me ask the group, what is your ideal vision for community engagement? If you as a board were engaging your community, what would that look like? What might you be doing more of or, or doing differently than what you do today? If you were to improve your community engagement as a board, what might that look like? High attendance at the board meetings, maybe. Depends on why they're there, right? Right. If they're there to watch the show, that's not exactly engagement. That's observing. What would what would community engagement look like? Surveys. Um... Could be surveys, getting input from the community. Uh, um, hi, Ethan, Ethan Bowen here, if I may. Um, yeah. Um, suddenly it comes to mind what we do with our state senators and representatives is that they have breakfast meetings and go. it's a chance for people to come and just talk you know just sort of and sort of say what we're working on as a board and say you know and, and I, I have no idea if it would work but it'd be something to try so like share concerns or or just get acquainted Don? Don? Yeah, we have a pretty strong parent teacher organization and they're very involved in uh, the sports around the school and things. And I think that's a good, a good symptom, if you will. Do they, do they get engaged or involved with the board at all? Uh, no, the, the board doesn't have anything to do with the sports. That's run entirely by them. But that's still something that the board doesn't have to do. They've taken that off the board's plate. Nice. What else? What, what would uh, what would improved community engagement look like if the board was more engaging of the community? What might you be doing or seeing? You'd be getting more feedback about what people think. You get more feedback from more people. Yeah. About how you're doing, or about things that they wish that we were doing in the schools. I think the type of questions you would get would be much more specific. Ah. because they understand i mean you know this has my been my big thing for a long time that i wanted a three ring binder right at the entrance way that has the curriculum in there you know and maybe it doesn't get followed but the idea is that parents know what's going on so then they can ask a question specific how did the unit on playing go how did this go how did the new style of teaching reading you know and, and we don't you know as parents we don't really get that information so there could be more thoughtful, more engaging questions. Good. Ethan, I, I have a, a goal, if you will, a vision that every school board member in Vermont can answer these three questions. How are the students doing in our district? What is our district doing to improve how they're doing? And how will we know we're making progress? Or what does success look like, right? I, I would like to see every school board member be able to engage with the public in answering those three questions. This is how our students are doing. This is how uh, what we're doing to improve how they're doing. And this is what our expectation is or what our, our goal is for progress in that. Imagine the board being able to, back to those overlapping circles, teachers in the classroom teaching in an effective way, administrators overseeing and administrating the work of the district in an effective way, the board being engaged with and thoughtful about how are the students doing? Are they learning what they need to learn? Are we making progress? What, are, what is the district doing to improve how they're doing? And being able to have that conversation with the community in that sense of coherence, everything kind of fits together. We better move to the next slide. Okay. Yeah. And so what does engagement mean to you? This is a kind of an etymology of the word Way back in the 14, 1500s, the word engagement was a pledge. It was an agreement between two people. They were engaged. 
Later in the 1600s, the word started to mean that it was occupying our attention. So somebody's calling me right now, but I'm not reaching for my phone because I'm engaged with you, right? And uh, maybe somebody else is on their phone, but engagement in the 1600s later began to mean it was a fight or a battle. So two countries would be engaged. They'd be engaged in a war. It wasn't until the 1700s that we started using the term engagement as a promise of marriage and exchanging a ring. And engagement in the early 1800s meant we had an appointment on the calendar. And then later toward the end of the 1800s, it, it made two gears were engaged, right? Uh, a machine was engaged together. So it was a coming together. Let's go to the next slide. Then the question is, what does engagement mean to you? Is it like the dog and cat that are engaged in play or in fight, whatever it is? Is it, is it like the ring where there's a promise? Or is it like salt and pepper that are just two things that go together, right? So, so think about, when you think about community engagement, what, what does it mean to you? People actively engaged in conversation, discussion, wrestling through a challenge? Um, is it gears that line up? Uh, or is it just two things that are kind of side by side, like salt and pepper? Any thoughts on that, Megan? Yeah, I just, as you're saying that, first of all, this is so helpful. Yet again, another great training, but um, I, I'm thinking about students. So I'm thinking, I, I'm seeing this like um, sort of parallel of board work engaging community members so it's like this connection and understanding like a you know back and forth or whatever but this is maybe a similar goal for teachers in a classroom engaging with students yes i like the gears when i when i think about the board and the district or the administration i like the gears because you know we're not micromanaging but we fit together this is coherent it makes sense anybody else something um, stand out to you about engagement Bill. I'm having a problem seeing engagement as a goal. I see a, engagement as a means to an end. Okay. And I really relate to your three goals, which is, you know, I think um, our SU board and our whole administrative team has adopted that or are pushing that as far as um, doing best by our students and uh -huh. being able to measure it and and have make sure that learning takes place and that we're as a board we. We have responsibility for that. Yep. One can't just hand it off to them. Um, the problem I'm having with engagement is that, to me, one of our roles as a board, and it goes back when I was in a director and everything else, one of the things that boards could do better than a director is excite the community about the importance of the task, the role, the responsibilities of the organization. One thing the board can do is to not only excite, but to have that community support the role, the in this case, the educational role of our students. Yes. Superintendent can't do that. They can, up to a point, we've got to be out there and explaining and selling. And one thing you're pointing out is we can't just be blowing smoke. We've got to be able to show them results and excite them about we're moving ahead. And I think, I don't know, it's not political, but it's just we're getting so tired and kind of worn down about all the bad news. Uh -huh that we're just assuming that it's the same old, same old. This isn't the same old organization. And our goal is not to be the same old, it's to accelerate and take off. And so as a board, we've gotta be able to articulate that. And so it's that sense of engagement. Um, and you might say, it doesn't sound two way, um, but I think it's extraordinarily important. And I think it's, if we're not doing that, it's gonna be very hard for our team, our administrative team, our teachers, we have the tools, the resources, the support to, to get the job. Well, you're partly built, you're talking about building public will. Yes. Right? And uh, one of those things on the earlier slide of the five was, you know, advocating for the schools, but in engaging the community in, in a thoughtful way, at, like an ambassador. Right? I, I used to like to think when I was a school board member, I, I, I thought of ourselves as uh, ambassadors 
of the schools to the community and then from the community to the schools. So very, very two way. Let's hit the next slide here. Um, so what does engagement look like? I mean, we talked about this a little bit and we got some input from you, um, but this idea of what, what might you be seeing or doing or, or hearing? One of the most exciting things I, I heard from someone one day was when I asked, what would it smell like if the community was engaged in the work of the board and the district in, in an appropriate way? You know, what, what would you hear or see or smell? You can hear that we're doing our job. I'd hear crickets. <laughs> oh, yeah, you'd hear that we're doing our job because they would be informed and they'd feel informed. Okay. Um, what about that smell? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, here, what was in the ear smell? Yeah. Z. Z. Touch. I mean, we'd see more people, um, hopefully, not, not ah. necessarily at events, but at events. At school events? Yeah. Um, Maybe even board. Yeah. I was going to say, um, um, I always think it's a good sign. Maybe, maybe it's not, but I always think it's a good sign to see a pickup, uh, see teachers talking with parents. Yes. Uh, I just think that's a really clear, direct communication. And sometimes I see, you know, a regular thing, like once a week or something, I see, you know, this teacher talking to that parent. Maybe, you know, I, I, I don't have no idea what's going on, but it seems to me that's a very clear indication of connection um you know um between you know that there's lines of communication i agree let's hit that next slide see where we're where we're going so what are some barriers to overcome when it comes to community engagement what are, what are some speed bumps or barriers to community engagement People are so busy now; it's hard for them to find the time to to um, to engage. I would think. That's good. People are busy. Absolutely. What's another barrier? Anger. Anger. They're upset. People, yeah. people get really angry, and it's really hard to commu communicate back and forth. <laughs> I think Robert's rules makes it difficult to engage too. Uh, Don? Yeah, I think the roles of the school in people's minds have changed. Uh, they've given up some of their parenting roles and they expect the schools to do it, unfortunately. Uh, that could be a barrier too. The one thing I would say about anger, when people are angry, they tend to be engaged. They may not be engaged the way we want them to be engaged, but they tend to be engaged. In, was it Newton? One of those laws of science that a body in motion is a lot easier to, to redirect than a body that's sitting still. It's hard to get it to move. And I, I felt like over the last year with the people that were all upset about the mask and the mask mandates and no mask and everybody mask, whatever, they were upset about like it was an opportunity for us to pivot and those people cared enough to show up and yell at a school board maybe they didn't come yell at you i don't know but they did in a lot of places around the country and you know they, they cared enough so i wondered how a system might follow up with those people a few months later six months later a year later you know they cared enough to show up one night maybe they actually care about what's happening in the school I don't know, that might sound a little Pollyannish. Um, it's probably not the right way to say that, but you know what I mean. Uh, I, I wonder. Let's hit the next slide, Bill. The other thing I would say is the people understanding the rules of the board, the yes. superintendent. I mean, I think as a board, we're learning, we're still learning that, like our role versus the superintendent's role versus the principal, the teachers. And I think that. The community doesn't always understand that, so they don't understand where they can be involved, where uh -huh. they can get involved. What if you had a great graphic or a one-pager that really described this is the role of the board, and 
customers that have a complaint about something in the classroom, you know, it kind of illustrated that chain of command. And so it showed that the board was not the customer complaint department, but you had a mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. And then maybe even examples of the kinds of things you would bring to the board's attention. Right. Something with the tax rate or, you know, that's actually in the board's purview, per se. Well, we, we talk about that all the time at our board meetings, and we talk about it on when somebody comes to us with a complaint and we redirect it, but maybe you're right, maybe we need to, maybe that's something the board can put out, like this is... Something on the website, a little brochure that's maybe at the meeting or at the schools. Yeah, so then people yeah. understand that chain of command and how it works and where we could help them. Yeah. Board, boards really run amok when they think they are the customer complaint department or when they think that a customer is the constituents. Because right? you got all these people who have no kids in the system that are your constituent. They're not necessarily a customer. Right? And it's easy to miss them and sort of focus on the parent and family, but miss you got this broader business community and service clubs that it would be great if they were engaged, as well as the governmental entities, too. Robert had a question. Robert had a question? Are you there, Robert? So identifying some of these barriers, people's time, uh, you know, in some areas, uh, translation is an issue. That may not be here for you, but certainly are your are your meetings or the opportunities to be engaged, are they always at a time when some people are not available? Um, and then the idea of surveys to get input so that people don't, you know, they can do that at 2 a.m. if they want to. Uh, some way to be connected that way. Let's hit the next slide. So just a couple more, you know, thinking through those barriers can help you uh, kind of define or get to the type of engagement that you want to have with your community. And the next slide here points out something really important. Who is your community? So we heard the word parents a few times here in the last 35 minutes. We heard uh, the word teacher. Heard board a little bit, superintendents by role was mentioned a couple times, but who is your community? Taxpayers. Taxpayers. Thank you, Sarah. Megan? I guess I kind of have a question. And it, is our community like the WRVS? We've got two sort of, right? We've got the big WRVSU community, and then we each have our individual boards with local communities. So, so you, have community. within the, you have communities within the community. Yeah, right. I get, and then there's probably communities within that community, right? Like there's the parent community yeah. and the, yeah. yeah. Shannon? Um, I, I would say our students are part of our community. It's been great to hear more from our students lately um, at some of our board meetings. Um, great. And, and hear directly how our policies are, are affecting them. Yeah, that's wonderful. Good, good point. Who else do you think of when you think of your community? Who is your community? Anyone else? We'll go to the next slide and we'll stay on this topic. There's a, a researcher at Harvard. Her name is Karen Mapp, and she has made uh, popular this idea of community mapping, right? So you put your district in the center of a whiteboard and you start identifying different subsets of the community. Families, local government, business, click one more time. And then you, you start to look at, well, okay, well, what, what, are, what about families, right? Are there some two income families, some single parent families, some non-parent families? And then begin to branch out farther, like, who, who else is there, right? Uh, even single parent families, that's not a monolith. There's different types of single parent families, right? There's those, there's those that are separated by income, might be separated by other kinds of factors, uh, some that are outward and some that are, are inward. But um, 
really this becomes very important if the board wants to engage the community that you're not just hearing from the same five or ten family and friends and neighbors that you always hear from or you're not engaging or involving that same group from the church or the gym or the workplace right that that if we're involving our community, it has to be bigger and way up and beyond. It is a powerful process to spend two to three hours as a team and write on a whiteboard, okay, who else? Who else? Because it's it's about the third or fourth who else that you really start to get to some groups that have been uh, neglected. And uh, in this case, we're talking about not just individuals, but actual groups of people that, that may, may speak a different language, may have a different lifestyle. Uh, who is it that we're missing in our, our question about who is our community? There's you've, somebody got, else. you've got a group in there that um, I think, how about alumni from the school? Because that, that would be important to, to get the input. And, and very, uh, very easy to mobilize. Right, they they have a heart already vested. Uh, sometimes mascots. Yeah, there's an issue. <laughs> they have emotions uh, about the way things work, but they're an important group to hear from, and you want their support. So I, I would encourage you again, just kind of expanding your mental model um, to get at that diversity of who is in your community. That you know they may all be white, or they may be 99% white. So diversity in the way they think, diversity in the way they live their lives, and asking yourselves as a team, who else, who, who might we be missing? Let's hit the next slide. Please. How do you engage them, partnerships? Let's go to the next slide. I love this um, co-author of chapter four here, Bill McCaw. He says, involving the community is more than a PR campaign. There's a district I've been working with. It's not that far from here. I've been working with them a lot recently, and they're all about communications, communications, communications. And I've been trying to nudge them that it's not the one-way communication, right? It's got to be. It's got to be two-way. It's not just having a communications director that can tell all the great stories, but it's having someone who will listen, receive, hear, input, and get that back into the conversation as well. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, a key takeaway here, if you can highlight that one for me. Yeah. You, you really want to develop a culture of inclusivity so that everyone in your entire community is invited, they're welcome to have a meaningful partnership with the district. One thing that my board did was we had the roundtables. Somebody mentioned with a, an elected official doing roundtables. We had roundtables with other governmental entities. So in our case, that was city councils, county commissioners, as well as state representatives. We'd sit together and have breakfast or lunch and have that, that two-way kind of governance to governance conversation. Sometimes that resulted in things like one of our cities sharing a tractor with the school district, a partnership that emerged. The board wasn't negotiating that or handling that. We were just bringing people together on a governance to governance level and partnerships start to emerge. Uh, there, there are districts around the country that end up with you know, some really cool innovative programs, whether it be with solar, other STEAM kind of things, or whether it be with uh, business opportunities where students get engaged, involved with. A lot of times it's because of a conversation that happened between a board member and someone else at a governance level. And, and, and it's a, a, imagine this, what if, right? What if, what could be, what could be developed with a library board and a school board? Uh, what could be developed that might help and benefit a whole community? Let's hit the next slide. So I wanted to share this, and you will have this available, all of you. Um, this is from the Illinois Association of School Boards, and we've touched on aspects of this. When you think about engagement, is your purpose to inform? Is it 
to get feedback? Is it to involve or is it to collaborate? All of those things are good and they're all important. And you need to do each of them at different times. But thinking about when is the time for the board to actually have a citizen advisory committee or some participation in your decision making, something you need the community's support, buy in, and not just for them to back what you do, but for you to really understand what they want. So yeah, I would encourage you to look at this as a team and maybe even you know kind of keep it in your hip pocket as it were. Uh, is this a time where we need to inform, consult, involve, or actually collaborate? And what what hits that threshold, right? What is it just, you know, when the ball game is, when graduation is, where that will be, well, that's informed. Uh, maybe we've got a critical decision. Maybe there's a budget cut that needs to happen. Do we need to consult with the public and get feedback? And let's not talk about mascots. Let's hit the next slide. <laughs> Because uh, so some ways that you can engage, uh, thinking about, again, how do you address those barriers, whether it's people's time uh, or the time of day or the location or do people need child care? What, what are some barriers that would help people be more engaged in, in the work that the board and the district are doing? And what are the groups out there Service clubs tend to love to partner with schools. Sometimes, interestingly, I, I've known of, of nursing homes that love to partner with schools. Um, I've seen programs where, you know, elderly people who can't get out can read to students somehow, or pen pal situations, right? There, there's a lot of different ways to be engaged, involved, but it all starts with somebody having a vision for, for what is possible. Let's go to the next slide, Bill. And just, uh, just to keep in mind this idea, I don't know who said this first. I've read it by different authors and I've looked it up on Google, but people are not up on what they're not in on. So the more that you can engage, the more that you can involve the community in the work of the board at the governance level, the more they're going to have their heart vested in the work that you're doing. And as you move forward in the coming months with revising your vision and your mission statement uh, and anything that rises to that strategic level, I just really want to encourage you to figure out how do we involve the community in this? How do we get their input? How do we get their thinking? How do we get them to help us in this uh, crafting of a, a strategic direction? And I think there's just one closing slide. It's got my email address there at the bottom. If you have questions or follow-ups, suggestions, uh, please let me know. Uh, we're always trying to improve everything we do, so you know, feedback is a gift. Uh, you say, Phil, you talk too much or too loud or too long or you had too many slides, I'll take that as, as a gift from you um, and any other suggestions you might have. So I know my time is up. Thank you for letting me be here again. Thank oh, you. No problem. Thank you for coming. Does anybody have any last-minute questions before? Thank you. No, this is useful. Thank you. Yeah, again, the more you can engage and involve your community, the more likely that you're going to be improving and achievement and closing gaps. And uh, remember, you know, have an answer to that question. How are the students doing? What data do you need? What do you need from the superintendent and his team to be able to answer that question in a intelligible way? Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any public comments? Jamie, you are up. <clears throat> so you all have my report in hand. Um, I'll just add the, and I'll get, continue to give updates at the local districts about all the work that happened at the uh, end of the legislative session. Um, there were no big surprises. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention that um, 
I'm really happy about, uh, well, one, the weighting study, and again, we will send those figures to you again um, in regards to what that means for our districts. For a majority of our districts, that's going to result in a decrease in, in ed tax rates, um, which is good news because, you know, I think one of the things that we're all monitoring really closely is this concept of a cliff. Um, in regards to the ed fund and I worried about the yield. Uh, we had a really positive yield this year. My worry about it is what's the yield gonna look like in the coming years. And I think we've all seen what that what that yield can do in regards to the, your tax rates. Um, and so that's one um, that that's positive news when we think about equity across the state. A lot of work was done there and the research that came out of UVM the other thing that um, happened was is that the special education law that had been delayed a few different times did take effect other than adverse effect. And um, so the block grant spending happened and uh, Annette, could probably, you put that in your report. Or, but I'll just let you know that really what it does is it gives school districts one more year in regards to uh, making certain that, that we have our system of supports, our MTSS system multi-tier systems of supports up and running across the state um, to make certain that we are documenting and demonstrating the intervention supports in progress monitoring data. So all this stuff that we talked to you about, about data teams mm -hmm. and teachers meeting about data to inform instruction and teachers meeting about data to inform intervention, that was all part of that bill as well. Um, and so we need to have that documented and running in a proficient method across the state in order for students to, um, for teams to be able to show adverse effect due to a disability to qualify for an IEP. Um, I think it's it, important for the board to remember, you can have a disability, right? A disability does not result in then qualification of an IEP. Um, and so, you know, we're continuing to do a lot more, um, I would say, education with our faculty and staff mm -hmm. to make certain folks understand what that means in regards to our educational support team process and our um, multi-tiered system of supports. But at the end of the day, you've heard me say time and time again, it's about responsive intervention and getting what students need in place in, in a swift manner that's research-based um, it makes sense. We want the intervention to be able to actually intervene on what the academic or social emotional gaps are for the student. Um, and so it's nice to have that in legislation, mm -hmm. right? Supporting this work. Um, the other thing um, that I wanted to mention for our unified districts is that the legislature did do a nice job in regards to outlining what decoupling of unified districts would look like um, if a community wanted to pursue that. I will send that bill out to all of you for review. Um, I think it's worthwhile for all the board to, to review that bill. Um, I wanted to mention before I just sent it out to you. So that is one that I, I would encourage you to take the time yeah. to uh, dig into. Um, it's much more thorough in regards to um, the role of the board, the role of the agency, the role of the state board, um, in the role of those who gather signatures of petition if they wanted to pursue the decoupling of a district. It also puts the onus, though, back on the unified district board as compared to it previously the select board. Um, so remember, before the select board would actually hold the vote, that's not the process now. It's actually the unified district board. Um, and it requires a study committee prior to holding the vote, much like you would have a study committee when you had a unified district. Um, so uh, I wanted to mention that bill um, as well. And um, I'll take any uh, oh, celebration. We had our, our last remaining budget successfully pass on Saturday in uh, first branch. And so, um, you know, it, and it was a, a real positive meeting. So uh, we were six for six with our budgets this year, which feels good. Um, so we'll take a couple months off from the budget season, but you know we'll roll out that budget calendar again in August and start working with all of our, our district boards um, and the SU board in September.
And I would like to say a big thank you to Jamie and his team. I feel like our meeting was very well. I, did, I wasn't at all of your other town meetings, so but ours was very organized. It was a great presentation. Um, there weren't a lot of questions because they, they did a really good job answering all the questions before they could come up. And I just really appreciate what you did putting that together for us. Here, here. Meg, I don't, are you, which bill are you indicating? The unified district bill or the no. special ed? Nope, the unified one. Or yep. actually both. Sometimes I it. I don't remember what they actually titled it, okay. um, but I will push it out. Okay. I wanted to comment on uh, contrast between the state of Vermont and their overall supervision and their legislation and policy regarding public education in this state and our wonderful state to the east of us. And I just read in the Valley News this Sunday about how um, there's major issues with morale and turnover and retirements and everything else. And we have those challenges too. But when you dug into it, it was mostly about New Hampshire. New Hampshire, and I might be exaggerating, but New Hampshire has a law that people can sue teachers. And, uh, and the state can penalize the teachers for what they're teaching or what they're saying. And I just, instead of, here we've got We've got this uh, legislation that's more fair on, on economic distribution of, of, of aid and support so we can have quality schools in our rural areas. I'm looking at our neighbor state and it's just mind boggling where you've got state legislation that that uh, could threaten our teachers with the front line of getting the educational process done. There was another law that I guess got vetoed was uh, 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 schools could not have, could not mandate masks. They could not have that decision. That was going to be removed from them. So I just want to say it's it's really good to be here in uh -huh. this state where we could be working together. Enormous challenges, but boy, it's it's disheartening to hear about other places that are putting up barriers um, to make it even more difficult to get a job. Is anything else for Jamie? Okay. Uh, Anda, are you on? I am on. Can you see me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or hear me? I guess hear me is most important. You can hear me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, well, you all also uh, have my report. Um, I think. Uh, I think the most important thing that's going on right now is that we've got a, um, a lot of students that are um, spending um, some pretty considerable time demonstrating all of their growth this year. And there's just a lot of different ways in which that happens. And sometimes I'll be back in June talking a lot more about the academics, but I, I think I consistently want to remind us collectively that this, there's a lot that goes on uh, in terms of learning and growth uh, in our schools throughout the year. And, and now is a time when a lot of that gets showcased through concerts and athletic events and um, all sorts of, you know, capstone presentation type things. And um, so if you see anything um, that's getting featured on social media or in school and district newsletters or get invited to anything, it's, a, it's just an amazing time to see how much has been accomplished this year. And so it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, and um, I think that's an important part to remember that we get a, a nice glimpse into uh, a year's worth of, of learning uh, at this time of year. I also feel like the other thing that I talk a lot to you all about is um, is what we're hearing from teachers. And I frankly, I feel like I could survey teachers every single day on a different thing to make sure we're getting their input. And I, I know we don't want to over survey them, um, but we've gotten a lot of good um, information and, and interest and feedback and energy around the professional development for the summer and next year. Um, and it's um, there's a lot of uh, really good alignment around where our, what our goals are and what teachers want, and I and I and they've you know pointed out some places where uh, they could use some additional training and support, and so we're we're looking into those areas. But um, it aligns really nicely to the goals that we currently have uh, around proficiency-based learning, those systems of support that Jamie was talking about that we want to continue to make sure that we have um, sort of robust supports at every at every level and ensure that our universal teaching is is really solid. Our you know our targeted intervention for kids that need that and then are intensive. So, um, the, you know, the teachers are are telling us they're looking for the same stuff that we're, we're hoping to support them with. So that's a, um, a really good sign as we head into end summer and the 
um, into next year around our professional learning. Um, and I think the, the last bit maybe to focus on again is um, we, yeah, I think we're working a lot on the, on the, all the grants. Um, so although I'm telling you all to be out looking at all those things happening in school, we'll probably be in the office trying to finish those all up. But there's a lot of, there's some good resources available um, and we wanna make sure we're targeting it towards um, sort of the high leverage needs that we have, um, particularly investing again in our, in our teachers and our support staff um, since they have shown us uh, throughout the year um, just what an incredible resource they are, how hard they're working with students in less than ideal conditions um, with COVID. And so I think we have a, a lot to, to put into them um, to continue to grow them as the, um, as the instruction, instructional leaders that they all are in their classrooms and throughout the schools. So happy to take any questions. Any thoughts? If you um, also, as I'm, we're working on those reports for next month on the academic um, reports. I think we've gotten good feedback throughout the year on what has been helpful, uh, and um, and what do you have questions around, but either here or um, through other venues. If there's other things that um, would help make those reports more clear for you, please uh, please let me know. Any questions? Thank you, Anna. Uh, Tara. Good evening, everyone. You have my report. It had a lot of information in it this month. I overviewed the budgets for each of the districts. I provided an overview of our federal grants and then our quarter three projections. So if anyone has any questions, I'll happily answer them, um, or if you want to set up a time, if it's more detailed than what we can cover tonight, I'm happy to do that as well. Any questions for Tara? Thank you, Tara. You're welcome. And sorry for skipping you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I have a little presentation. That's right. I have a little presentation. I'm very excited to, uh, to share this with all of you. Um, this is. Are you going to start with your report or the? Presentation? No, I'm going to go right into the presentation on the, the good stuff. Uh, so I want to turn to all of you a little bit about um, since we've been talking about the importance of progress monitoring, and also when we talk about multi-tier systems of support, um, you know the. Our alternative classrooms here um, at the White River Valley Supervisory Union kind of fall in that top intensive um, tier when you're talking about a multi-tier systems of support. So it is a small kind of cohort of students. Um, and um, we have just had an amazing year. Um, we have had two um, just fantastic um, highly qualified um, special educators this year um, just do some wonderful work um, with some of our most intensive students here in our supervisory union. Um, so I worked with them to kind of put this present presentation together because I wanted, um, you know, what was important to them to be shared with all of you um, as well. And so some of these pictures that you see in the front are um, some of our elementary and middle school students um, doing some of their work. Some of it is they were exploring and identifying plants. And one student um, was so excited about um, his learning that he did an at-home um, planet project and then came and did his own presentation um, to his class um, at the elementary level. Um, and then the middle school has been doing a lot of focus with cooking, that they're making um, a school-wide cookbook um, with recipes that middle schoolers could make at home, you know, by themselves. So that's just what some of those pictures represent. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, the next slide just is a description that um, I, I did some work this past summer, this past August, um, with the the special educators coming into the into these classrooms um, and together we've kind of um, you know came up with a description of you know what would we tell people that that you do right that what are these classrooms for um, and so this is what um, you know we came up with this summer um, is that you know it really offers opportunities for 
personalized learning, whether it be social emotional learning or academic learning. Um, for students that are at the elementary, middle school, and high school level, um, you know, and it gives them time to practice um, and to kind of really focus on instruction that'll help them, you know, increase their opportunities to be in the school wide community. Sometimes, you know, the students who are in um, the classrooms, they need to learn how to be in a classroom. They need to learn what it's like to be students. There are just some other barriers that are in the way, the kind of blocking that. And, you know, those the classrooms and the teachers and all of the service providers for those classrooms are there to help work with the students and teach them about their barriers and how to work through them so that they can be part of the greater school community. Um, so then also, you know, the work we, some of the work we did this past summer is kind of breaking down. So what were, what do the opportunities look like at each of the levels, the elementary, middle and high school level? And then how do they, you know, relate to one another? How is there this kind of like growth in what an elementary student does versus a middle school student versus a high school student? So this is some of the opportunities that are offered uh, you know, at the elementary level. This is just kind of a tip of the iceberg is that you know, they get their, their direct, highly qualified you know, academic instruction. Um, also, you know, they get instruction with social, social skills and self-regulation. Um, they get some opportunities you know, for some mental health work you know, with a clinician or a behavioral specialist. Um, and also they get the opportunity to participate with their greater community. Um, and this year um, was the first year that it wasn't just a self-contained, all of these uh, classrooms, they weren't just self-contained classrooms where the students never left the room, um, which is how it had been in the past. Mm -hmm. um, the students were included in their school communities by uh, going to essentials. Um, so art, music, PE, library, et cetera, um, so that they, you know, would have the opportunity to practice some of the skills that they've been learning in their classrooms. Um, so that was, so that was a switch. And I do have to say, you know, that just general education community and, you know, building principals were very much on board with this. Um, they were very open arms and really just kind of surrounded all of the students um, with open hearts and open minds. And I think did a lot of learning themselves about how they can support the students, you know, in their essentials as well. Um, so some of the elementary data from this year is um, as of, you know, right now, there are seven students full time um, in the classroom. There, there has been eight students um, that have attended the classroom. Um, there's only been one student referral this year, um, which is really low, which is great. Um, that means that, you know, a majority or you know, most of our students have been able to be um, successfully supported, you know, within the general education um, curriculum, whether that be at the universal or targeted level, which means that just shows that we've got some great universal supports in place for all of our students and that they're responding to it. Um, so that's wonderful. And right now we have two students who are currently in the elementary alternative classroom that are working on transition back to their gen ed classes. Um, one student I got word will be full time um, in their in their gen ed classroom next year and it's been a transition that they've been working on for quite a few months um, and um, the student and the family are very very excited so um, and then for the past few years i just wanted to know that the average class size was nine um, so we've been you know down a little bit on the numbers which has just been a great success again it just shows that universally you know we've been able to capture students um, at a better at a greater level than we have in the past. Nice. Um, the teacher, her name is Kylie Edwards, um, is the special educator that kind of runs, uh, you know, the elementary classroom. Um, she, you know, wanted to share all of this, that they do a check-in, check-out um, system, which is generally used at the targeted level, but they've been, you know, using it to kind of stay with the, what, what is happening universally in the school so again so kids can be connected 
and not doing something completely separate. So they're kind of learning what other students are doing. Um, the universal goal um, for the South Royalton Elementary campus for check in check out is 80%. Um, but in the alternative classroom, you know, they've decided as a staff and as a community that they were going to make it 89%, that they were going to raise the bar. Um, and as you can see in September when school first started, the average um, for the whole class was 66%. Students uh, at the beginning of the school year, um, I can say, uh, had a really hard time transitioning back to school. Um, but also, I think the expectations within the elementary alternative classroom were very different than what the students had left in the previous year. Um, there was a much more academic focus, um, and they were really um, making it look like a gen ed classroom um, with the built in social emotional supports and actually practicing in the moment when something felt uncomfortable, you know, what, what you do, which was just a huge shift for the students. And they just didn't have the stamina that, you know, you would expect um, from an elementary school student. So they had to work on stamina. They had to work on this new routine, new staff. Um, and so things were a little bit lower in September, but then, you know, the latest data that I had was um, from April and they hit their goal um, of 89%, um, percent, which is a 23% um, daily increase. Um, so students are now hitting, hitting that goal. And when I look at each of the months, they've hit it a couple other months um, throughout the year as well. Um, and what the students um, look at through this check-in, check-out process, they're evaluated, they do a self-evaluation um, after each block, but also um, the staff do one. And then at the end, as part of their checkout, um, they they kind of put their two, two papers together and they have a conversation about what the day looked like. And there's this real emphasis on, well, tomorrow is a brand new day. Like, right, we all have bumps in the road. We all kind of have bad days or bad moments but it doesn't define who you are and it just doesn't define what the rest of your day looks like or what the rest of your week looks like. Um, so there's this real kind of self-reflection piece that goes along with that. And really they're emphasizing being safe, being responsible, respectful, and kind, which are also the PBIS um, uh, universal um, criteria that they're focus on, focusing on at the um, South Royalton Elementary campus as well. So they're trying to stay connected and not be separate. Um, so also just as, a, as an average for the class, there's been an average um, of five letter levels through the Fontes and Pinnell reading assessment. So that means um, you know, on average students went up five letter levels um, from the beginning of the year um, until now, which is amazing. Um, and also two students um, are, are assessing um, at grade level in all content areas. Um, and that, you know, another student, and this just kind of shows the range of abilities that are mixed in one classroom that, you know, um, Kylie really has to differentiate and really personalize learning when you have two students who are now at grade level but then you have another student who was only able to count, you know, to 10 at the beginning of the year, who is now able to count to 100 plus, um, which is a huge growth for that particular student when we look at individual students. Um, and then, you know, another one was, um, you know, a student announced to their parents during a, the parent teacher conferences, you know, that I'm a fiction reader which you know the students even know what fiction and nonfiction was right at the beginning of the year and you know was even saying like i'm not a reader like i don't know how to read i don't care about reading um, but now it's saying i'm a fiction reader like they found their niche they found what they what they love and um, are now seeing themselves as a reader so this all just melts my heart and i just get so excited these are just wonderful positive you know successes
Um, so at the middle school level, which is at the Bethel campus, that's for grades six through eight, um, Sarah Fisher Snow is the special educator who um, coordinates and kind of runs um, that particular alternative classroom. Again, a brand new um, first year teacher, um, same as Kylie, um, but they both have, you know, wonderful background in alternative education. So for that particular classroom, very similar to middle school, uh, I mean, to elementary school, where there's this kind of high focus on, you know, academics. Um, but also they really bring in the social emotional piece and also restorative justice um, within um, their classroom. Um, students are you know, able to engage in exploring some flexible pathways at the middle school level. Um, so they're starting to kind of explore what their interests are and maybe what they would be interested in pursuing more once they get to high school. So they're kind of getting high school ready. Um, there's much more ownership, um, you know, over, you know, what their, what their program looks like. Um, and they do a lot of goal setting um, at the middle school level. Um, you know, they do have the opportunity to participate in, this, in essentials in outdoor education that's offered there. And um, they do do some off campus events um, as well. So the middle school data, um, as of May, there's nine students um, currently in the classroom full time. Um, there have been 12 students that have attended or you know been part of the classroom at some point throughout the school year. Um, three students have transitioned to all gen ed classes. Um, there have been five student referrals um, this year for the middle school alternative classroom. Um, you know, I think just nationally, um, there's kind of been an increase, you know, with middle schoolers and um, kind of mental health and more kind of social emotional um, demands. Um, you know, whether that's, you know, part of what we've seen, you know, with the pandemic or, you know, just things happening in, in our world in general, but just at the middle school level overall in our country, um, there's been a, a huge increase with, you know, just kind of mental health. Um, and so we're, we're kind of seeing that as well um, in our middle school level. I think that's why um, the referrals are, are also a little bit higher. Um, not that all five of those referrals actually attended the um, alternative classroom, because when I get a referral um, for um, an alternative classroom or even a referral for a special education evaluation. I do a lot of reviewing of data and do a lot of having conversations with classroom teachers and, you know, building administration or other um, service providers that have worked with the student. Um, and some students, there are just things that, you know, maybe hadn't been tried. And so I, you know, offer supports and suggestions um, along the way. And so some students um, you know, can be supported that way. There are just some things that people maybe not have to think of or, you know, wasn't sure it was a resource. Um, so there's some of that as well that happens. Um, and then three students have, you know, transitioned back, but the class size in the past has generally been about six. So as you can see, there's, there is that, in, there is that global increase and we're seeing it as well um, in our middle schools. Um, Sarah Fisher wanted to um, to share this data there. If we had waited like one more week, they're doing their um, their assessments this week. Um, and so I won't have numbers up until May, but we'll have numbers till January. So for the star reading assessment, that's kind of given as a universal assessment. Um, the average scale score increased from September to January, 103 points, um, which is amazing. Um, same for math, there was an, an increase in the scale scores of 40 points. Um, for the, um, there, there's a computerized program called IXL, um, and a lot of the students, you know, use that as kind of their independent work time. Um, and um, as an average for the whole class, 
as a class, they have shown proficiency in 803 of the skill areas combined math and language arts, um, which is just amazing because again, I think the academic rigor um, of this year is very different than what the students have seen in the past. So again, in the beginning of the school year in September and October, there was um, a lot more pushback about kind of what their day looked like and why are we reading so much and why are we writing so much? Um, there's a lot of writing that happens in middle school. Um, and so it's great to see that they're you know, now hitting all of these proficiencies that they didn't have before. Um, you know, they're, the students, again, like I was talking about the, the writing, uh, students were claiming, I don't write. Like, I'm not a writer. Like, you want me to write a paragraph? Um, you know, there's a lot of pushback about that. Now, six students independently write multi-paragraph responses to questions independently, um, which before they wouldn't even give you a complete sentence. Um, and students are well, re well versed in the tenets of the, those restorative practices. So, you know, when they've done something um, that might have been inappropriate, you know, whether it hurt someone's feelings or, you know, maybe they hurt classroom property or something, um, they, they know kind of what the consequences are, you know, before, before or after they do it. Um, and, and so they are really well versed in having the conversations that need to happen to kind of repair relationships with people if something um, came between the relationship or, you know, even the feeling of everyone being safe back in that classroom community. Um, they know how to have those tough conversations um, and kind of own up to what they did and what their part was and kind of how it made other people feel. Because we know sometimes when you get to that middle school, high school um, level, there's a more focus on on me and that, you know, the, themselves. And so it's nice to kind of um, hear that they're um, taking ownership and, and um, acknowledging other people's feelings and thoughts. Um, and they've completed two rounds of student-led conferences. So at the beginning I talked about they, all the students set goals for themselves. So at the first student-led conference, they shared their goals with their parents um, and then at the second parent-teacher conference, they actually provided data to their parents to show how they were either getting close to their goal or how they needed to work a little bit harder to get to their goal or adjust their goal. So um, they're already doing student-led conferences as part of, um, part of their classroom. And the last one is the White River Valley High School, um, which is new this year. Um, it's a new program this year. And um, the high school had a, uh, a special educator to kind of facilitate it, run it. Um, and then they um, happened to leave us um, as part of moving out of state, um, retirement, different opportunity, um, back in like the first part of November. So since the beginning of November, um, the, the alternative classroom at the high school has actually um, been led by gen ed teachers um, that were teaching some alternative classes um, within that classroom. Um, it is, you know, it's taken, it's taken the building principal and myself and, you know, some other staff to kind of keep it moving and, you know, keep it all um, connected, but there's been this great sense of ownership, um, you know, by um, the general education teachers at the high school. So I very much appreciate them for that and their commitment to the students um, that are in those, that are in that classroom. Um, so it's a personalized learning classroom and they um, have courses that are geared, um, you know, for their um, abilities in uh, literacy and also math. Um, next year, I think we're opening it up to science as, as well. So it'll be like an alternative science class. Um, over the semester, kind of that literacy class is, 
is kind of morphed into more of a humanities, um, alternative humanities class. So it incorporates some social studies with also some literature and some writing. Um, so that's been wonderful to see kind of how that's, that's evolved. Um, there, there have been some flexible pathways experiences where they're kind of connecting their learning to real world experiences. They've gone on a few um, trips um, to learn about kind of how far your dollar goes um, mm -hmm. and um, kind of, you know, what's out there beyond what's in our small little communities. They've um, gone into kind of West Lebanon and and explored, you know, some shops and grocery stores and did some kind of meal planning and um, just kind of really learning about real life. Um, and they've also had the opportunity to work with, you know, our mental health staff that's at the high school. Um, and they've also had some opportunity to make their own selection for elective courses that are tailored towards their interests. Um, there are many great electives at the high school from, you know, woodworking to, you know, ceramics to an art to like a digital art course to some culinary. So it's really great that they kind of get to dabble in these experiences as well as part of this. Um, so the high school data is right now there are seven full time students, um, but there are 15 plus, you know, it's it's probably ranges to almost 20 students at this time that kind of use it in a part time basis. And the seven students that are there full time are mostly freshmen. There are um, there are just kind of a couple of sophomores, but we're finding it to be more of like a freshman transition. Um, which happened this year, and that the 15 plus are more uh, upperclassmen that are juniors and seniors mm -hmm. that were actually kind of using it as more of an incentive and more of a wraparound for them to stay in school and finish. Um, so we're really wrapping around them and their courses and getting them the help they need. And, that, and some of it is even just the motivation um, in the relationship with more adults in the building um, so that they'll continue to, you know, come to school um, and finish kind of what they've been working so hard for, not to give up at the end. Um, and it's really working. Um, there's been five total student referrals um, to the full time um, at the high school. Um, all of the full-time students are now taking two or more gen ed courses, whether that be an elective or some are going to a science course. Um, and that's why we thought um, we spoke with the, the science um, teacher and she um, is wonderful and has agreed to, um, you know, kind of open up and do kind of an alternative kind of general science um, to try to capture more students because she's really enjoyed having the students that she had. Um, and have in her room. So that's just wonderful. Um, three students um, were able to trans transition back this fall from um, those out of district placements. Um, and that um, we are hoping right now there are three more scheduled to come back next fall. Um, and so next year it's slated that we'll have 11 full-time students um, accessing the room. And so we're able to capture more students um, and provide them what they need at kind of their upper, upper level. Are there any questions? That was a lot of information and thank you. I'm so excited to, to share it. There's just been so much hard work, you know, from the students, but also the school community is that's just really exciting to share. I think it's amazing. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank Welcome. you for sharing it. It like tell it it's like really makes my heart feel good. Well that's <laughs> I was going to say it's 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 so for me it's so wonderful to put a, a somewhat of a face on special ed because basically it's just a, a sped that's it it's like like a, a live basically all I know is sped and and there's these numbers and these things and I, I get some sense of it but this is just really really wonderful to to really have a face to what the program is um, and the only question I had was just what you answered at the very end was whether we were getting some of the kids back from these 
you know, as, as Jamie sort of put them out, expensive, out, <laughs> out farther away programs, because that was really the goal was to, to you know, to, to take care of our own. Um, but uh, I just really, really well done. And thank you so much for tonight. I, I, I found it very, very useful. Yeah, so Ethan, just something to know, which I, you know, maybe I should have noted, all of the students that are accessing the alternative classrooms at all levels, all of them are not being serviced via an IEP. Um, so some, some students are special education, some um, have medical 504 plans, and some okay. actually do not. They have like, uh, they have EST plans. Um, gotcha. So it's not Get just all confused. No, no, it's okay. It's something good to know that it's not just a special ed mm -hmm. um, classroom or a special ed initiative. That really, it's an it's an intensive um, classroom or an intensive service that is there for all of our students, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what we want our mindset to be: is that MTSS, the multi tiered systems of support, is there for all students at any point in their learning that they need that kind of support or that kind of help. And so that's what it's there for. It just happens to fall under our purview, uh -huh. you know, run by a special educator, but it really is there for, for all students, just like all, like all the other um, interventions are. So that's also exciting okay. that, you know, that we don't have to wait that long, right? We don't have to wait for them to possibly yep. qualify for special education, that we can catch them early, give them the skills that they need, and get them back going in their general education classroom. I mean, that just helps with their self-esteem, but also their academic progress, and just being able to be part of the community. So, yeah. Great, thank you so much. I just had a quick question regarding the next phase. I know that some of the students on IEPs are eligible to stay in school after their 18th, 19th birthday. Have we started putting a contingency plan in place for that event? Yeah, so currently none of the students that are in our alternate classrooms are either at that particular stage in their life um, or if they're some of the students that are older that are finishing, they don't qualify for the staying in longer. They'll have enough credits and, and shown their proficiencies and they'll be able to graduate. So we, we are doing some work in the, in the summer. We're getting together kind of as an alternative classroom um, cohort with the building principals. And I mean, yes, there are things that we need to build upon unlike, you know, kind of like how does a student transition out? Like, is there a certain criteria? You know, what would that look like? So there are things that we've, you know, still need to build upon that we're going to talk about, um, you know, over the summer. And same even at the high school level, this was our first year, and we lost a special educator along the way and had to shift left and right and all around. Um, you know, so kind of what is that going to continue to look like? Because it didn't quite go the course we originally had planned, but it was still really successful just because of the commitment of, you know, all of the adults that, you know, are at the high school. So, um, so we still have a lot of work to do and we're, we have those dates scheduled to work on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. welcome. Yes. Um, Megan. Hi, I wanted to say thanks. That was great. Um, I was just looking at a lot of the stuff and it looks like really great practice. And so my two, I have two sort of related questions that maybe are rhetorical or answer later, which would be fine. But um, one is when the kids are tr transitioning out of this intensive, how are they doing? Like, is it like things fall away and they're, and they um, have to go back right away? Um, and then the second, or are they like, you know, fledging? Um, and then the second is, it just sounds like great practice. And I'm wondering if we have structures in place to like, capture what you're learning and sort of bring that to our individual schools, right? Like some of those small class sizes or, you know, individualized, however, however you're doing this that's working in all those bullet pointed lists, are there structures to, to um, make it so that we end up using those things across the district? Yeah. So, yes. So your first, your first couple questions. So the transitions are very thoughtful and individualized and they don't just happen. 
um, you know, the students is for some students, it is, you know, a three, four, five month process um, is, is what their transition looks like. You know, for other students, it might be a month or two. Um, we've had no students who have left need to go back. Um, so that means, you know, we've been very mindful um, in our transition and also providing them kind of what they need for structure um, and um, also differentiation um, when they leave the classroom. So that just shows that we're doing good education with our gen ed teachers and our gen ed staff when they do leave the classroom. So they're very mindful and there's no time limit. You know, that's the thing too. There's no pressure um, that the student has to be out in a month. Um, and so it can be, it can be, you know, it can take a long time, but I'd rather it take a long time and be successful than rush it and then they have to go back. Um, Cause that, again, that can just really crush a student's self-esteem um, going back and forth. Um, and then um, your second question about um, what we've learned in implementing um, universally. I think um, bringing in kind of the Clara Martin um, staff, so um, the clinicians and, um, you know, the behavioral analyst, uh, Christian McQuarrie, I think a lot of that has helped make the connection between what we can offer in a smaller group and then what's kind of being offered universally to all students. We just do it in a smaller, in a smaller setting. But I think definitely some of those social emotional um, skills and learning are happening now more universally, which I think then everyone's just going to be more successful. And there's that connection between, like I know the middle school, they are doing restorative practices um, in a few different of our few different middle schools, and even some of our entire districts, um, you know, are are doing those practices. I think you know the alternative classrooms being connected with the universal PBIS systems that helps because you know uh, universally the, the schools are using PBIS. So kind of teaching the students in the smaller group how that works and what it looks like and what it feels like and give that time to feel a little success and then kind of branching them out into the, the to the larger community who uses the same system, I think is really helpful. Um, so I think really kind of the success is really connecting the classrooms with their greater community and not keeping them separate as separate entities, doing very different things. Um, everyone is all very connected and doing kind of the, the same work, um, which is just really helpful. What's PBIS? <laughs> Positive behavior <laughs> interventions and supports. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, I could use that once in a while. Myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Amazing presentation. Thank you. It's really good. It's nice. <laughs> yes, I really appreciate it. And ready. Okay. Thank you. As I uh, bring up my own report here and look back to my notes. Uh, I will, of course, entertain any questions. And uh, the one thing I wanted to add was that we got a minor revision upward in ADM in February. Just found this out. Only half a percent. But uh, the, reason, the reason I mention is that you know, the number went up. Uh, and so I have a lot more confidence these days in the number being robust and lasting over time, as opposed to when I arrived having to re-report 112 kids this year and the prior year, meaning for 18 and 19. And then uh, the rest of my report is uh, pretty nuts and bolts, uh, not aligning to the goals this time. Uh, we've done some work in PD, and we face some component shortages on certain items. But we're uh, planning to uh, utilize ESSER money to uh, help support instruction in classrooms. Any questions of Ray? Thank you, Ray. Maybe I'll just say something. Again, I love making comparisons. I don't want to sound negative towards another community, and I won't mention the community's name, but somebody, and this is all conjecture, but say for years, the clocks in the school, the high school, never run time. In other words, every clock was different. I mean, this has gone on for years and years and years and years. And you think about, that's pretty basic. 
and then I'm looking at Ray's report and robotics and this um, assistive technology and um, mm -hmm. the vector solutions. I'm not going to ask anybody here to define any of those terms, but look what we're doing. And I assume our clocks are basically reporting on time. So that's another <laughs> indicator in my mind how well we're doing and moving in the direction. We're going. So, thank you. Thank you, Bill. But, uh... The work is its own reward. It's a pleasure to support uh, the education happening around. Uh, Bright River Valley SU Policy Committee, we had a meeting at 5 o'clock right before the 6 o'clock meeting. Um, there are two policies that we're working on. We're working on the C35 social media and C35, the verification of student residency for tuition payment and corresponding affidavit. Um, they are in board packets. Yep. They are in your board packets. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, we have a revision that we're going to make in the social media one. Um, when that comes back, the committee will move them forward for our first reading. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? No, just they're there. Um, they're hyperlinks to oh. on the agenda. They're, they should be in your pack, but they're also hyperlinks in the agenda. Um, and I, I can email them out too. Um, the committee, like I said, they have a, the residency verification one. I think the committee is going to be prepared to take action to move it forward for your official first reading in June. Um, and hopefully, possibly the social media as well. So um, the goal would be to try to get these um, adopted by. September at the latest. Um, ideally, August would have been great, but we recess in July. So I like to have two readings happen. So, any questions about the policy work? Okay. Both have been uh, vetted by legal counsel, too, just so the board's aware. Legal counsel's read through and uh, given their thumbs up on both of these. Jen? There was some interest from our board to get a, uh, a flag policy, and we were hoping that might be available by September. Do we think that might still happen? So at, at our committee, we discussed with if the, the committee was going to take that up and we're going to, Jamie's going to, we looked at a sample policy and he's going to bring some stuff forward to us at the next policy committee meeting, which will be yeah. in June. So yes. Okay. I have You're a very Shannon. interested constituent who lives in my house, so he keeps asking. Okay. Uh, next. Special. <laughs> next on our agenda is the Superintendent's Evaluation Committee. Um, we met last, so we've been working with the VSBA. We did the survey. We had a really positive tur turnout from the board this time, which we did last year too, but. Um, very positive on getting the surveys filled out and back. Um, um, we have another meeting for that committee. So we've still have got ongoing work, but the superintendent evaluation portion is now finished for us. We're going to bring that forward to you tonight for hopefully for approval. And then that's it. That's, that's the discussion. Item. <laughs> that's the discussion. Item. So under discussion <laughs> items, um, superintendents, professional goals, um, 22-23. Um, did everybody receive my email? I sent um, the final product out that we received from the VSBA. Um, we went through a process where, with, for the goals, at, at least, um, the board got together, the committee got together and came up with some goals. Jamie came up with a set of goals of his own, and then we got together and finalized the set of goals that you see in that document. Um, the one thing we found, which was really really rewarding and good is that our goals pretty much aligned. We worked on them separately and brought them together and they were basically the same goals. We just fine tuned them to one document. Are there any questions on the process? Did everybody read, have an opportunity to read the document? Okay. Kathy, I read the document, but I didn't feel like I had like enough time to really like give it attention today. 
And I'm curious about like the process of approval. Like, what's the? Can you give me some information about the like purpose of the document? Um, like the evaluation stuff, I was fully on board on. It was the goals that I got stuck on because I looked at those and I felt like I didn't really quite understand what those were for. So we can go through the goals if you want to talk about them before we approve them. But the, the idea would be to bring them forward and have you guys look them over and approve them at the board level tonight, just so they're for Jamie, so he knows what his goals are going to be going forward for next year. I also felt, and I, I, maybe I'm off on this, I felt like I wanted to like let the our local board see those, but again, I'm sometimes confused about the order of operations and the hierarchies and things, I know that. Um, I, I think it, if, if, if it's if the group feels like we need to to wait and take them to the individual boards we can do that um, but members of the individual boards served on that committee that's what i was going to say is that that every board had a, a, a representative on that committee well i'll just add i really I think having a reading at each district, if that is something the board wanted to pursue, they could. I think it's good to remind all of ourselves that I actually report to this board directly, right? So this is the board that evaluates me, um, is the full board. Um, and so the goals are in alignment um, in attunement, I would say, with the feedback that I received through the evaluation process that everyone completed. And that's a reminder that that's not just board members that complete that survey, it's also my administrative team. Um, and also um, in alignment with what the committee felt like, I don't wanna speak on behalf of the committee, but certainly a shared vision around the work ahead um, in regards to the priorities of um, me serving as your CEO. And, um, and I, what I would say is I feel better about this year that we have some more measurable indicators underneath each goal as compared to prior where I felt like it was a little less quantitative um, and a little more qualitative data to measure it. John? Yeah, I, I don't know about now, but I know in the past that if there's been a, just a single board wanting to go back to their individual boards, we've allowed it. I don't know if that's changed or not, but. All right. Um, Thanks, Don. Can I ask say one more thing as the that said individual board member? Because I, I might be able to let it go. But the other question I have is, um, what the relationship between the goals in this evaluation are and the like bigger picture strategic planning mission vision and things like that. I think that's kind of where, where I'm stuck. Like I, I looked at those and they seemed really similar to some of the strategic planning goals, but I don't, I don't know how that process has gone or where we are, like how frequently we revisit that. I've been on the board for a couple of years, but I haven't really seen it. Is this that, is this that happening or is this just look a little bit like it? Well, one of the things we talked about is we're going, to, we're going to start the work on a new strategic plan, um, and it's in it's in that document. Um, so I'll let some of the other committee talk, and maybe they can explain it better, Meg. Before we, so Andrew. Yeah, I would I would kind of think of these as the way that we evaluate Jamie next year. So these are are the things that we're telling Jamie that are his goals for next year that we're going to use to when we do his evaluation next year, we're going to look at these goals and see how he did on these things. And you can see some of the goals is setting up strategic vision for going forward. So this isn't in place of, you know, goals for the supervisory union as a whole, though they do, you know, clearly Jamie's in charge of the supervisory union. So when we set his goals, we're setting, you know, we're kind of saying what direction the supervisory union should go in. But they're kind of a continuation of what they were last year and then also kind of setting the stage for how, you know, providing goals for making goals for where we're going. So I don't know if that helps a little bit, but that's kind of my view on what this is. It's kind of how we evaluate him next year in lieu of the goals that we're giving him this year. Shannon, you're on the committee also. Did you have anything to add? 
No, I, I agree with Andrew. This is just setting up what we'd like to see um, for the coming year. Sarah. I think Andrew said it well, thank you. All right, and Stacy, you're also on the committee. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> and Don, you're also on the committee. Do you agree that that's? I do agree that that's the intent of the goals. That's the evaluation crux for the coming year. Thank you. All right, Meg, does that, does that, does that help? That's really helpful information. And I actually feel like, unfortunately, I don't feel prepared to vote on it tonight. I feel like there, there were some parts of the goals that didn't feel like necessarily the direction that um, I would want to like vote for. Um, I will say that like I wholeheartedly would approve of Jamie's performance. So I, that, I don't want to get mixed up in that. It's just that as we think about directions of where we want our superintendent to take the SU, I wasn't totally on board with that. And I'd like a little bit more time to, to digest it. The idea of the process that we go with the, the BSBA, that's what this document is, is to evaluate the superintendent and set his goals for next year for the evaluation. So they're not a separate thing. That's fine. We can move ahead. I might just abstain from voting, but that's totally fine. I'm, it's fine with me. Did anybody else have questions or thoughts or about the the document that I sent to you? All right. So under action items, we have superintendent professional goals. I make the motion that we adopt the uh, superintendent's professional goals for the school the. 22-23 year as presented to us um, by Kathy in the CSB, whatever it is, <laughs> Vermont School Board Association. I second that. Discussion? Um, I just, uh, this process is really important and I wasn't part of it last year, but uh, these are meaningful goals. This goes to the core of what we're all about as an SU, why we're on boards, why we're interested in education, uh, why we're interested in kids and community, um, and they're ambitious. And if we can achieve through um, our superintendent, and I happen to think that it's our role too to support this, uh, and we'll talk about that some other time, um, we'll have achieved extremely meaningful improvements and advancement in the education and the well-being of our system and our, our students and our educational community. And uh, the committee spent a lot of time on this. Um, and it was a collaborative effort. And I'm proud to say that uh, what we've got here is, is, is worthwhile to support. And as Don says, we'll, this is meaningful measurements for our uh, administrative team uh, led by Jamie, as well as the SU um, that we can be um, tuning in on next year and, uh, and measuring it as we go. So I'm fully supportive of this motion. Thank you, Bill. I'm sorry, I didn't ask you. No, that's fine. <laughs> Not shy. All right. Um, I'll offer a little context in the one that I, uh, the, the, um, the first goal was the one that was uh, hard. For me. I think that said, I just want to to centralize, but for respect and appreciation to your superintendent as well as the uh, committee. Um, so, you want some clarification on goal number one? Is that Meg? No, no it's no. clear what it said. No. I just, I, it wasn't like it was, that was the part that I didn't uh, I felt. So, that's why I wanted to offer that for future, you know, future committee times next year coming around or whatever. Thank you. Um, any other discussion? All right, hearing no, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Maybe, maybe we should do a roll call. It's harder when everybody's on the screen. So I'll start with you, Meg. Uh, abstain. Don. Aye. 
Sarah? Aye. Stacy? Aye. Cannon? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Maggie? Aye. Robert? I don't think I can vote. Okay, he's not voting yet. Oh, okay. Um, Sylvie. Sylvie is. Aye. Sue? Aye. Is that all the board members? Yeah. Bill? Aye. Kathy's an aye. All right, so the ayes have it. Thank you, everybody. And um, really appreciate it. The, the committee did put a lot of work into the the process and the document, and we appreciate the help of the VSBA. All right. I don't have any resignations or new hires. No. Um, so no resignations, no new hires. Any other business? Can I can I ask a question? So are we no longer practicing? If a member has a question, we're going to just continue on with our business. We answered the question, and I don't. I don't remember the practice you're talking about. Uh, okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to put on that we put on our radar is per, we've talked about um, board mentors for new board members. Um, it'd be great if people could come back with thoughts and ideas um, as to how we could set that up and make it work um, on a new committee now for something totally different from the board and we have a mentoring program from people who've been on there for a while and I found it really useful to be able to tap into that information that those uh, prior board members have so an idea that I have so I'll try to get it on the agenda for next time and maybe we can talk more about it if you guys can think about it um, our next meeting date is Monday June 27th at 6 o'clock yeah um, something for uh, possible consideration for on our agenda in the future is looking at uh, Jamie's goals as more than Jamie's goals as a possibly a foundation or a blueprint for our SU board goals. Um, if we're not together, if we're not in the same team, in the same room, pushing the same direction, the same energy, uh, the chances of achieving these goals are going to be the, uh, less. And so I, it seems to me it's worthwhile, and I appreciate the question about have we, have we looked at these goals and they, are they really something we're comfortable with? I think that's a discussion to have, and um, I support that, and I think it's worthwhile to have it as a future agenda item um, with your support. Thank Absolutely. You. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so the next meeting, Kathy, the next meeting will be the reorganization meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. Everybody's budgets and votes are done now. So. Uh -huh. All right. Um, I'll accept a motion to adjourn, guys. So moved. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Yep.